Hi everyone, uh, hi all posthumans out there. It is my great pleasure to have another incredible scholar to be interviewed here at Posthumans. First of all, Mas, uh, welcome to our blog. Thank you, thank you for having me. Ah, thank you so much. Now, uh, it is my great pleasure because Ms. Rosenthal Thompson has been working on the topic of the posthuman since year 2005, which is really impressive, uh, really a pioneer in this field. And also because he's part of this uh, movement uh, of scholars uh, based at Aarhus University in Denmark who are working on it very seriously and rigor rigorously uh, connected to a center that I would like all of you uh, to know about, which is the um, Faculty of Research program entitled Human Futures. And actually, Matt is the director of this program. So now that a lot of people are interested in studying the posthuman, please uh, check this program out. It's really incredible. Now, uh, Mess is a professor of comparative literature at uh, Aros University, based in Denmark, Europe. He's the author of uh, numerous books. Uh, we are going to focus on two of them in our interview. So we're going to interview uh, Mess uh, based on two topics. The first one is uh, related to a book that he published in 2012, which is entitled The Post-Human Condition, Ethics, Aesthetics and Politics of uh, Biotechnological Challenges. And this book, again, is something that I really highly recommend. It's an edited volume, and I do teach a course uh, here at NYU every, some, every season uh, on posthumanism, and I always uh, have some uh, chapters out of this book, including one from Francis Fukuyama. We are going to talk about it. Mm. Um, so again, I highly recommend it. It's also in the uh, screen behind us, uh, The Posthuman Condition. And this is the first interview with uh, Mess, which is entitled The Anthropocene and Transhumanism. And we're going to talk about evolution and how technological developments are going to affect human evolution and not only. The second interview that we're going to have with Mess is related to literature. He's been working again on uh, the topic of literature and the posthuman for a very long time. He has many, many books on this topic. I'm going to mention one, but again, check uh, his biography because he has many more. The one that I'm going to mention is entitled The New Human in Literature, Posthuman Visions of uh, Changes in Body, Mind and Society, which was uh, published by Bloomsbury in 2013. And one more book that I want to mention because is the future, is coming up and is very much needed in the field of posthuman studies, is the forthcoming The Bloomsbury Handbook of Posthumanism, which is coming out in 2020. Mm -hmm. Again, highly needed in the field of posthuman studies at the moment. So again, uh, Messi, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you so much for being at NYU and being interviewed at Posthumans. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So again, we have so many topics that we could talk uh, mm. with you, but we're going to focus first on the topic of the Anthropocene and transhumanism. In this sense, I would like to quote you, mm. and I'm going to ask you some questions about this, because in the posthuman condition, uh, Mess uh, wrote a fantastic introduction with Casper uh, Lippert, Ras, uh, Monsen, and uh, Jacob Wamberg, in which they talk about evolution. Mm. So this is what they say. The pace of Charles Darwin's evolution by natural selection is very slow. However, in the past two decades, this perspective has shifted as a number of astounding technological developments have taken place. These developments have the power to completely overturn human evolution from its dependency on unplanned mutations and natural selection to an artificial evolution where conscious decision and technological design matter more. This shift promises a profound transformation of humanity and society as a whole, and thus it has received a quite dramatic name, the posthuman. Yeah. All right, now it's here to tell us more about this. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and this was written seven, eight years ago, and I think it still holds. Uh, and it's, I mean, the whole field of posthumanism is a big thought and, and, and it's a big challenge to think about how we're situated in this situation. And going back to Darwin, you could say that uh, we should already then have realized that uh, there could be an, uh, something coming after the human. Uh, but there was no need to think seriously about it because, again, as we write in the book, uh, things were moving uh, rather slowly. Uh, so you had ideas. H.G. Uh, Wells imagined what would happen if 800,000 years uh, up the road something would happen and, and, and that kind of time, time spans. Uh, and obviously now we're in a completely different situation and just between 
2012 when we wrote this and now uh, we have for example the advent of a three parent baby uh, which is not to say you can you can argue what is the threshold of saying that we are post humans uh, some would say that's perfectly uh, good as a threshold that we have been able to uh, circumvent one of the, the most uh, defining traits of, uh, of reprocreation, namely that, that two individuals uh, share their genes and become uh, a third uh, individual. But now you have a free parent baby and there's a lot of details to what that is and so on. Uh, but, but the whole idea that, that you are able to tingle with uh, the, the human genome uh, mm, I yes, mean, on this topic, yeah. uh, I remember the news, yeah, it was, yeah. uh, I think, three years ago, big news yeah. uh, in science. And, uh, but let's say someone uh, did not catch the news and they say, three parents, baby, what's that? Yeah, yeah. Do you mind explaining a little bit what do we mean by that? Because this is like, yeah, this is the past, yeah, it's not yeah. even the future, it's not science fiction, it's no, no, already no. been done. It, it's been done. I mean, when I wrote the New Human Literature, I used it as an example that could happen. And now it has happened. Essentially, it is replacing a very small part of uh, the, a fertilized egg, of the, the DNA in a fertilized egg, with some uh, parts from a third uh, person, in order to avoid uh, uh, diseases. Uh, and apparently, I mean, again, these things are shady. Uh, I, I have no doubts about that this is a procedure that has been put, put forward, and the philosophical consequences of saying, well, Essentially, this child will be like any other child. It has not been sort of upgraded or enhanced and so on, mm -hmm. uh, but you could say it has uh, received a kind of therapy in advance to avoid uh, certain diseases. Uh, because the first child that was born actually had two siblings that had both died. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ethical question going into that. Uh, also, whether you should sort of uh, uh, invest a lot of money in uh, fulfill the wishes of two parents of uh, having their genes mixed why they couldn't settle for uh, having a donor and so on. So, so that, there's a lot of things going into that. But the, the kind of news that are coming, I mean, sort of says that, that we could establish a threshold. Other people say, it doesn't really matter. I mean, uh, the idea of the post-human is something that, that should be more radical, that should be, have different properties, that should be real enhancement or so on. Um, and I'm all for having a, a broad discussion about that, but you cannot ignore that there has been technological intervention into the very core of what it means to be uh, be human at the moment, namely that, that we reproduce like animals. But we, we know now that, of course, we, we don't just do that. Fantastic. Talking on which, uh, at the moment, yeah, it's been done to avoid some diseases. What mm. if some people say, we would like to have a child together, we are not a classical um, couple. Yeah. There are four of us who, you know, like uh, really want a child, mm. we want to live in a community, back to the 60s, 60s if we want, yeah, or yeah, back to yeah, the future. Yeah. And we want to have a child together is not based on, you know, avoid mm. disease. How would you feel about that? Can we can be this implemented as a social opportunity or should be strictly uh, reflecting a medical condition? Yeah. I mean, it really goes to the core of how you politically regulate mm. these things yeah. and whether you have opposing schools, people who would mm. say that, uh, well, society should provide freedom for the citizens. Mm. Uh, and on the other hand, people who say, well, we should regulate society to mm. have a good society for everybody. And uh, when I talk with high school students about this topic, one of the fears they have is the, the fear of having a divided humanity. Mm. Uh, something where, where you could say that, 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 that okay, we, we cannot really think of ourselves as belonging to the same species anymore. Mm. And, and that's something that people really fear. And if you just, just let it go and say, well, uh, let's just uh, play around with uh, these things, you could enter into a path where you would say, well, then, then we end up with something where uh, the division of, of humanity could become something that we should take very, very seriously. And we see glimpses of that, and when we hear about uh, people investing in uh, life-prolonging uh, uh, technologies and so on, and have the hopes of beating death or at least live very long and so on, mm -hmm. you're also entering uh, a field where you could say, but if it's not for everybody, and somebody can live to be 150 and others will die uh, at 75.3 years or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, then you would feel that, that we have a divided humanity. And there are lots of other ways that we could imagine that. And that's, of, of course, a, a big question because, I mean, you could make the argument and say, well, uh, we should push forward, uh, people should be free to do so and so on, the state does know my, own my body. And that would be also to say, well, we have, a con to have to be concerned about uh, the greater good. Uh, mm. So there will, and, and, and we're just at the beginning of that. I mean, the, the, mm. there will be so many challenges, ethical challenges to this. Uh, so it's a good thing that while 
some of the problems, some of the challenges are sort of at a size, at a level where we can handle it, that we practice very hard on, on, on dealing with that. Talking of which, there is a criticism uh, actually in the book that you published uh, um, by Fukuyama about yes. radical life extension. Yes. For our listening, uh, radical life extension is something that is uh, embraced by all transhumanists. And the idea is that you want to radically uh, ex um, expand the life. We're not mm. talking about 100 years. We're talking about 800 yeah, years, yeah, 1,000 yeah, yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really radically expanding life. Uh, the transhumanist movement used to call it immortality. They got a lot of, cr a lot of criticism because eventually everything changes and, and dies. Even technology mm. has to be accredited. So Natasha Vitamor actually came with this notion of uh, radical life extension, which is mm. now being uh, broadly embraced by all transhumanists. Mm. So again, um, Fukuyama is a very interesting criticism that a lot of my students love is resources. Mm. So let's say, yeah, someone, uh, of course, uh, at the moment, it would be more people who have uh, the resources, economic resources to have access to these uh, speculative technologies. Mm. Let's say that some humans uh, get the chance to re-upgrade themselves mm. through nanotechnology, uh, understanding more epigenetics, and let's say that they get the chance to live such a long life. Mm in a scenario where some humans actually have the, uh, don't even have the chance to go to infancy because uh, they don't have enough food. Mm. But apart from the disparity in class, what about resources? What about the Earth? What about the Anthropocene? Yeah. Can we really support this project when the resources at the moment are actually fading out because mm. of human actions? Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people say no. Mm. Uh, uh, and others will say, well, well, I mean, where to put it to say that, that, mm. that there really are very different camps mm. and sometimes you feel that the, the Anthropocene has an idea that, that humans changes everything and, and has a catastrophic influence on the earth. Uh, they change everything except themselves because a lot of people working on the Anthropocene really don't have much of interest in, in uh, transhumanism. Mm. And on the other hand you could say that you have sort of the very narcissistic uh, idea of, uh, of life extension that as long as I get saved as long as I can be frozen or mm. extended or whatever, uh, then things are fine and then the, the rest of the world can go wherever it wants to. Um, and, and of course, I, I, I would rather be in the camp that thinks of, of the larger picture. Mm. Uh, also because I think a lot of the things that are happening at the moment, uh, I mean, we, we're not that close to have a radical life extension as far as, as I know. Uh, and maybe there are things happening in secret labs and so on mm -hmm. uh, that, that will prove me uh, wrong, but I don't think we are that near. And uh, Fukuyama also has uh, some some doubts about it that he uh, airs, uh, and, and, and sort of a, a bit of a sarcastic view on it, saying, well, okay, so maybe we can extend uh, the bodily life somehow, but there are so many factors to what constitutes a human. Mm -hmm. And for example, uh, the whole question of uh, becoming senile. Uh, uh, getting Alzheimer's and so on. Mm. Uh, so so he, he almost chuckled at a conference saying, well, uh, then you'll have 120 year olds, but uh, the past, the last 50 years of their lives will be horrible because they will mm. have Alzheimer's. Uh, so, so that was a long detour to say, yeah, I, I think we should be very careful about thinking about solving uh, problems in, in, in the right order. Mm. Uh, th there will be new th things that we can solve. And that's also sort of uh, what we should also also be concerned about. Also, I think ethically that that we don't sort of say, well, we, we cannot go further. We should stop. We should. Uh, and, and and some people argue they say, well, we should just uh, quit the whole idea of, of being human. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be better for the earth for humans to disappear. And I don't quite agree with that. I mean, and that, that's the many positions you, you find in this whole field of are you post-anthropocentric, mm. are you transhuman, uh, are you post-anthropocentric but still pro-humanist, mm. or are you uh, anti-humanist? So there are many different ways of, of trying to figure out what's the stance towards uh, the, the situation that we are in. Fantastic. And uh, I want to go one more big question for you because sure. you can answer that and you're very good at answering these big questions. All right, so we're going to talk about dignity and I'm going to go to the very end of the introduction written uh -huh. by Matt with uh, other colleagues in which he asked this in question that I'm asking you and I ask all of you to think about mm. because uh, they also say in the conclusion that there is no one answer mm. that is correct but possibility which is this. So what if the path of achieving dignity goes through 
the embracement of technological advances. So in this section, I want to ask you, well, what does it mean to be human? Because Fukuyama also stands on an essentialist perspective, which mm. has been criticized by a lot of posthumanists. So yeah, there is not yeah, yeah. an essence core of being human, even from a genetic level, no, because no, we share 99.9, yeah. we don't share 100% yeah, yeah, yeah. of DNA. Um, and also, yeah, what is human dignity and what is posthuman dignity? Mm. Very good question. It, interesting. I mean, the, the I mean, it's been a while since I read that introduction, uh, and that we finish with dignity, which is something that also uh, Frank Fukuyama takes up in his uh, work on identity, and which I think is, is, is still a, a good question to to ask. Uh, and it's something that, that we keep redefining. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's incredible how much culture moves. And I think at the moment where we see it uh, the most is, for example, uh, in terms of gender and, and being respected and, and uh, have dignity in, in terms of being recognized mm -hmm. uh, for what you are. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it is moving so fast and in so many directions mm -hmm. uh, that, that you could say that uh, a lot of ordinary people cannot keep up with ways of identifying, where, for example, some uh, corporations really are at the forefront of saying, well, we, we, uh, are, we understand the need to recognize gender as a much more complex phenomena as the binary uh, division we've had for, uh, for millennia. Uh, so, so you could say that that's one example of, of how, how culture is, is defining what dignity is and how we are sort of uh, having a constant conversation about uh, how do we uh, pay respect to people? Uh, so so that, 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 that would be one point. Of course also, I mean, then you could say well, human dignity uh, then also is, and, and that might be sort of a very old-fashioned conservative way of, of defining it, but, but that you have a, uh, a dignified, uh, humane life uh, from birth till death. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we can increase uh, the humaneness and uh, the the, the lack of, uh, of, of pain and so on uh, during life, uh, that is something that's very likely going to take place also with things that sort of would push us towards being more post the, 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 the more therapies, being hooked more up to technologies. Uh, so we, have, we haven't talked about suborification, but which may also be one of the things that, that will sort of put a threshold in these decades, years, century that we're living, saying, well, this is where people said, well, we're, we're not going to give up some of the things that our uh, integration with technology will give us. So we willingly become post-human. And that would be also one of the most interesting thresholds when people say we cannot imagine life without being uh, uh, medicined by uh, different devices, of uh, having things uh, replaced during our lifetimes, uh, of growing artificial uh, organs and so on in order to prove our life as a whole. And I think those things, I mean, it's easy to frown upon, uh, but I think gradually as, as, as people will be offered these things and as society at large, and of course the huge medical industry we have and the regulations, fortunately, that we have, uh, but th these things will, uh, will, will come into being. Fantastic. Of course, I have one last question because this is too interesting. I'm not ready to end this conversation. One more question before we go into the second sure, uh, sure. interview. This is so interesting and it's really focusing on the main goal of transhumanism, mm. which is human enhancement. And you were very clear about the idea of like human dignity mm. as expanding the notion of a human life mm. from birth to death. Now, how is this constructed on the privileges of the human? And is this applied to the non-human? Because I'm thinking, for instance, of the food industry, which is completely mm. in inhumane. Yeah. And I'm thinking if this goal of uh, enhancing yeah. existence although it's very anthropocentric for the transhumanist movement, uh, the posthumanist movement mm. give a different answer. And I know that you are uh, interested in both movements. Mm. And if you maybe actually you're more of a posthumanist, if I can say, than a transhumanist. Mm. Sure. So I would ask you, how does anthropocentrism, which is accepting human exceptionalism, play a role in this discussion of enhancing existence, mm. which in this case, We've been focusing a lot about talking about the human, mm. but how is within in, in the in the relation to the non-human? Mm. How are the non-human affected uh, by the uh, enhancing the human project? Yeah, I mean, you talked about resources. That's of course one mm. way of putting it, saying, well, if, if we can do these things without doing any harm, mm. but our history shows that that we may not be able to do that. Mm. Um, 
It, it's, it's a big question. And, 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 and the, the real big question is, I mean, how do we as human organize ourselves in a way that we can, can feel that, 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 that we, are, we are serving the world better? Uh, which is so tremendously difficult. And I, I would say that, that most of what we do, I mean, we are, we are involved with some kind of hypocrisy mm -hmm. about, uh, of course, promoting s certain cases, uh, certain things that we think we should do differently, mm -hmm. but we, we cannot really exist without also doing a lot of damage uh, on the other hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's a big project, figuring out how we can move in a direction where we say, okay, so, so we can live as, uh, as, as inhabitants of the earth uh, that sort of takes care of it, uh, but uh, also still uh, claiming to, to be inhabitants of it. But, 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 it, it, but it's a, such a big question. I think, I mean, there's a lot of statistics that, that could shock people. I think one of those that would still shock people is how large a part of uh, land-based vertebrae uh, life, which is either humans or livestock, and the mass of that is more than 98%. So uh, ideas about that, 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 that we humans and then we have nature. Mm. Uh, of course, there's a, the oceans, so there's a lot of life uh, that is not vertebrae, uh, but uh, the amount of life that is uh, uh, controlled by humans uh, is staggering. Uh, and, and of course, there's so many movements that say, well, well we should just think hard about that, how we eat, how we uh, pollute, uh, and so on. So. And I'm optimistic. I mean, I'm from Denmark. Uh, we have a lot of min windmills. Not everything mm. is great, but uh, we are moving to at least a way of, of getting energy, uh, which is uh, a huge break with uh, 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 centuries of consumptions of fossil fuels. This is a great way to end the conversation because this is a starting. Mm. I really invite all of you to follow Mass uh, work, uh, to actually visit him also at the University of Denmark, Aros University. They are doing a really incredible job on these topics. We have the pleasure to go on with the conversation, mm. changing a little bit uh, our mm, main uh, discussion, which is going to be the next interview with Mass and is going to focus more on post-humanism uh, and, uh, and its connection with literature. Uh? So in this uh, conversation, we talked about uh, uh, evolution, science, the Anthropocene and transhumanism, human enhancement. In the second one, we're going to focus most, most clearly on post-humanism and literature. So thank you so much, Mes, for being here with us and sharing your deep insight about the post-human. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.